Welcome to For the Record. I'm John Ehrlichman. We're here at Angel Stadium in Anaheim, California. Compared to a lot of businesses, America's pastime has held up pretty well during this downturn. And nobody knows that better than the sports super agent, Scott Boris. Baseball America named him the most influential non-player of the last 25 years. And his Rolodex helps explain why. From Alex Rodriguez to Manny Ramirez, pick a big name player and chances are it's Boris negotiating the deal. We caught up with Boris, a former minor league ball player, at his office in Newport Beach. And yes, Boris has baseball art. Hanging from the ceiling, a corkscrew of dozens of Louisville sluggers. On the wall, baseball signed by major leaguers he represents. And as a further reminder of the big commissions he pulls in, there are life-size posters of clients like Manny Ramirez. Boris became a household name when he negotiated Alex Rodriguez's $252 million deal in 2000, a contract eclipsed only by A-Rod's most recent deal with the Yankees. Mike Kramer was president of the Rangers when Rodriguez was signed. It's hard to sum up Scott in one word, uh, but give me a break and let me do a couple. Aggressive, smart, challenging, um, maybe... Uh, overreaches, uh, but a, a tough guy, a very complex guy. A complex guy whose mission remains simple. Stick to the one sport he knows and loves. We don't represent players in other sports because our effectiveness is based upon the fact that we were players, we lived the life, and our focus is just 24-7 on one sport. And I want the athletes that we represent to know that we monitor the sport from every level, amateur, international, uh, minor league, major league, so that we really can have a feel for the advice that we give. And uh, certainly it would be more of a, uh, as far as a business plan goes, it's, you'd be widely more successful economically if you negotiated uh, on behalf of top players in all sports. But I just don't know what to say to a seven foot NBA player or a 350 pound lineman um, and I think you would fall into that trap of being uh, very general about what you see from a lot of people who are in the business of representing players, and that's just not something I ever wanted to be. One thing we've heard in the media and baseball circles is that there are some teams that won't negotiate with Scott Boris. Is that true? Are there really teams out there that won't negotiate with you? Uh, I can only give you the best evidence, and that is in the last three years we've negotiated a contract with every major league team. I could probably go back historically and tell you that um, I don't know of any owner or any franchise that does not want premium talent and that's what we're associated with. Let's talk a little bit about the free agency process. The Scott Boris binders which are legendary and presented to teams that are interested in some of your clients. I think it's Johnny Damon of the New York Yankees who once joked he looked at his binder and he felt like Ty Cobb, after, after looking at it. I mean, is that a signature Boris strategy? With maybe as many as 100, 150 free agents available in Major League Baseball annually, uh, the press, the teams, the owners, and, and our own players, for them to have a historical perspective of how, they, uh, how their performance uh, rates among current players, past players, in some instances the history of the game, it put a perspective on it, I think, that gave everyone a measurement that was a little bit different than what was available. You're the representative for the 2009 number one pick of the Washington Nationals, Steven Strasburg, a hard-throwing right-hander from San Diego State. Or are we at a turning point for the league in terms of what owners are willing to pay for draft picks? The owners and I are in agreement that draft picks are, should not receive a dramatic amount of compensation, mainly because of the fact that more than likely these players are not going to be long-term answers to the success of a franchise. So uh, the numbers are just clear. But every player that we've asked for $4 million or more in the draft has turned out to be not only a major leaguer, but grandly successful major leaguers. I want to talk about the dark cloud, if you will, over baseball performance enhancing drugs. Uh, from the context of financially, has it hurt the game? 
So far, the suggestion is no. As for player salaries, if there's a player that's been caught up in a scandal like this and that player is uh, up for a contract renegotiation or free agency in a year or let's say two years, how might that player be affected by all this? I think the, the damning of players for conduct uh, that occurred in the early 2000s is one where frankly all of us myself included who've been in the game a long time we could have done a better job in education we could have done a better job in, in creating a, a better approach to this process more boundaries more medical knowledge to everybody ownership and players and um, and we've suffered from that in the early 2000s now that we're seeing a very strong testing system take effect and we're seeing the very few players that uh, are, frankly the players are certified by that testing system to be uh, within the boundaries of the game and those boundaries are to be legislated annually despite all the issues the fan interest has risen which is the greatest statement because I think once the fans know that there are steps being taken and once they know that the sport is as real and natural as it, it could be for the era, then I think the fact that that interest will continue and then the contracts are justified because the revenues are uh, given to the owners by the fans. Welcome back to For the Record, I'm John Ehrlichman. Baseball's super agent Scott Boris gets a lot of attention for the deals he negotiates, but deals are just one part of his business, Boris Corporation. He helps clients with their marketing needs. He even has psychologists on staff. Our commitment to players is one where the genesis of it is when you were a player. What did you need? And I always wish that I had more information about how to be a better player. Well, I had three knee operations. I would have wanted to know more about conditioning. And so we set up a, uh, a sport fitness institute. We have our own trainers who interact with the club's trainers. And we monitor our players year-round. We provide them with information. We, uh, we have a, a very specialized approach that is just related to baseball. And, and we have different plans for a catcher versus a pitcher or a, a relief pitcher versus a starting pitcher. And, infielders versus outfielders and so this is we try to bring as much science and conversation into the community of this so we can do our best to give players information so that they have a plan on the psychological side there's just uh, there's no player I've ever represented that has not gone into that moment the abyss because that's where the game takes you no matter how talented you are the uh, the factors that relate to expectancy are, are the uh, off the field factors or the how you put yourself in a position to be driven over uh, such a long period of time to stay on top of the game and to be effective in the game uh, is it is a absolute challenge obviously a tragedy earlier this year with the passing of Nick uh, Aiden Hart I'm I know you were close with him I'm just I'm curious to know how you've been dealing with it how it's affected you we go to the ballpark in Anaheim a lot and uh, there's still a memorial out there for Nick and uh, you know you you think about it every day you think about your own children you think about the players you work with um, it's certainly something that, that you're with them the night before and you see a dad and a son share a moment after a great successful major league beginning and and then to be in the hospital and, and seeing the loss of a family and their son and a community and a team. And, and um, it was, uh, uh, where, where you realize you're very fortunate in this business that, you know, where you, you, you don't deal with tragedy. Um, and uh, it's certainly for all of us, I think, in the game, we, we took a step back and, uh, made us realize the privilege and also kind of to be a little bit more in touch with the good things that are going on around you as sometimes you get a little bit wrapped up in the, in the, in the dynamics of, of the business and the concerns. You're obviously very close to the players you represent. You said that baseball is what you know and representing baseball players is what you'll continue to do. In the past you've also said that 
going to a team, being a baseball executive is not something that interests you. Is that a 100% certainty that you would never join a team or maybe become an owner or a partial owner? You're a pretty wealthy guy. Well, we certainly had the opportunities, and I can honestly tell you that uh, you know, when the, when the game has been a lot to you, it's been everything to you in your life as far as what you've been able to, to provide and achieve your goals and provide for your family and those things. Uh, you really want to do what's best for it. And I really think that my role uh, in the game is I just better serve it by being a part of the balance that's involved directly with players. Um, certainly the one thing about the game that is, is a bit difficult from being on a team and part of a player is that you, uh, you go to the ballpark and you, you may have two clients pitching against one another and you, you can't root for a team. You don't get to do that. Uh, but you, you certainly can root for your clients. You've said you've received offers for Boris Corporation. You've said no in the past. Is that the long-term intention, just to, to maintain ownership? I kind of have a different view of this. I, I view I walk into people's homes, and, and I deal with players. I have players that are now retired. And uh, I kind of view it as you'd be selling your players, selling the relationship. I want families to know, I want parents to know, I want players to know that we're, we're not, uh, what and how we define how we serve our players. It's not done by a board of directors, it's not done by shareholders, it's not done by people that have not played the game and wore a uniform. It's done by the people you've hired. And I don't, I, I want that credo to stand uh, and uh, I've, made a very advanced succession plan if anything were to happen to me that that would continue and certainly the selling of this institution is uh, not something that uh, would ever happen certainly uh, under you know while I'm alive or as long as my legal documents are, are living. Welcome back to For the Record, I'm John Ehrlichman. Baseball's super agent Scott Boris spends a lot of his time at ballparks like this one in Anaheim, California. But growing up was a different story. Boris was raised on a dairy farm outside of Sacramento and didn't get to his first major league game until the age of 15. By then, his own baseball skills were opening doors. Well, I'm very fortunate because it's, it's, it's something that few people get to stay in for their whole life. And I get to go to a ballpark every night and I get to smell the grass and and I'm actually a lot better when I go to the ballpark because I'm better at what I do than I was when I was a player but the the idea of it is that it's uh, it's something that's always been a passion of mine and a love and and uh, we I don't really view this as work I really view it as something where we're you wake up every day you don't represent pieces of paper or bricks or buildings or or uh, entities you represent a ball player. So you played minor league ball, you highlighted your injuries which were certainly a setback, you were a great player. Talk to us about a turning point for you. I believe it was after spring training one year, you're in the player parking lot, there are other players that didn't make the team, that are heading off to uncertain financial futures and you have a revelation, you think what? It's a day where you go there and you make the club and you're feeling really good and you only see a side of professional baseball that's the great side and that is achieving your dreams and, and getting to play ball against the best every day there's really nothing like it and then you walk out of the locker room and you're you're feeling you're feeling really really good about what transpired that day and then you go to the parking lot and you see people you used to play with you see their wives crying, their children seeing their parents upset, they're crying. They have no jobs, they have no future. Uh, they don't have an education. They were the stars of their high school classes because they were the great baseball player who was drafted. Um, they had money at a young age, and four or five years later, they have nothing. And when you realize that that happens to 99% of the players that sign a pro contract. That's how it ends up. They don't see the big leagues. They, they play three or four years in the minor leagues and they're done. 
I just never thought about it. I want to take you back to 1983. It's the amateur draft. You're representing the number one pick, Tim Belcher, drafted number one by the Minnesota Twins. The Twins put an offer on the table. It looks like offers that we've seen from first round picks for who knows how many years. Tell us what you said to your client. The draft began in 1965 and Rick Mundy got $100,000 to sign. 17 years later, Sean Dunstan was the number one pick in the nation and he got offered $100,000 to sign. The revenues of the game had gone up dramatically and yet for the drafted player, they had remained static. I knew something was going to happen to the game unless it changed. And that meant that the great athletes were going to go to the NBA or the NFL or the NHL because they were, they were increasing their bonus offers to players. And that was the point that we made to the players. And, and eventually, that's, we started moving the bonuses through a representation process that resulted in them getting somewhat of a, of a value point that represented what their true value to the franchise was. One thing that I find interesting, you have a PhD in pharmacology, and from what I understand, during that process you learned how to go about pricing products that aren't yet on the market. Did that help you when you were trying to determine what is the value of a baseball player? I think my medical training helped me a great deal in understanding the need for expertise in bringing about the durability of a player primary issue in their careers is the game. The game will always beat you and the time frame you can wear a uniform is very limited and you've got to do extraordinary things and have an extraordinary path to, to stay competitive with the game. Welcome back to For the Record, I'm John Ehrlichman. Baseball's super agent Scott Boris has clients all over the world and part of his specialty is taking players from one league to the major leagues. A great example came in 2006 when he took a Japanese pitching sensation known to fans as Dice K and brought him to the Boston Red Sox. Talk about the significance from your company perspective, from your career perspective, how that influenced your client roster compared to, say, the Alex Rodriguez signing back in the winter of 2000. I don't think that uh, Dice K signing had you know, we're not really in the Japanese market um, that often, uh, mainly because the level of play there is not one that would allow for a Japanese player here to come here and be a significant major league player for a long time. It's a little bit different than bringing players here from the Dominican or Venezuela or Puerto Rico, where, you, where those, they have generations of families and players where the players grow up knowing where they're going knowing what the process is, and they've had really their childhood to prepare for it. You've talked about this idea of perhaps expanding Major League Baseball to the Pacific Rim. You're not a league executive, but what are the odds of that happening? Well, I, I think the financial structure uh, and, the, and the, certainly the, the uh, populace and the industry base uh, would, it's, it's an absolute fit. Uh, we would. I think the game would be tremendously successful. They had a couple teams in Japan and certainly a team in Korea and, uh, and possibly maybe even a team in Taiwan. Uh, but we've got to implement uh, a little bit uh, faster jet travel to allow that to happen because it's just been, frankly, very difficult on the teams that have gone to Japan and have come back here to play to start their seasons. It's, it's been a, a process for the clubs that have done that. Something else that you've talked a little bit about is potentially changing the World Series instead of having seven games, maybe you have nine games, you have the first two games played in a neutral city and how do you decide on that city? You bid for the rights like the Olympics. There are obviously there are a lot of traditionalists in baseball. Well, I too am a traditionalist and I was actually talking about a return to the World Series of nine games, not creating a new, because in the, at the beginning of the, of the century here we had a uh, 19th century, we had a nine-game World Series. If we had a World Series weekend, where on a Friday we could have a gala where we could announce the Rookie of the Year, the Most Valuable Players, the Sighing Award winner, a televised event, the money could be donated to charity, to, to advancing the game in inner cities, to a number of, to raise money in that regard. We could have a true home run hitting contest where we have the sluggers who qualified other than the World Series participants. Uh, and then on a Saturday and Sunday, we would have the opportunity 
for fans can plan their vacations. They can plan, corporations can plan major events around the World Series, and they could bring it to that particular place. And then we go back to the traditional uh, seven-game approach. The fans are still arriving for this game here in Anaheim, California, and a lot of teams are still managing to get bums and seats. But this upcoming offseason could mark a turning point for Major League Baseball. Has league revenue peaked? And if so, can super agents like Scott Boris continue to get the same kind of contracts that their clients have come to expect? Talk to some league owners and they'll say no. Speak to others and they'll say don't bet against Scott Boris and his ability to make that happen. For the record, I'm John Erlichman.